Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, our webinar on culture fit, where we will explore handling the cultural differences between Asia and Scandinavia. For this webinar, we will uh, focus in the context of uh, distributed teams in the software industry. I'm Kalana Vijay Sekara. I'll be your moderator for today. Joining with me today for this webinar, Doug Honiswa, the chairman at 99X, Hasit Yagahavita, the CEO at 99X, and Samra Aman, Senior Manager Delivery at 99X. It's great to have you all joining today. In today's discussion or the webinar, we will start with focus topics from each of our panelists. And I welcome all of you, the audience, to send in your questions through Q&A feature so that uh, we can direct um, the questions to our panelists afterwards. To set the context for today's webinar, um, in today's business world, um, distributed teams provide incredible advantages and value. So it just makes sense to use them. But however, distributed teams also means we usually work across different cultures. And different cultures are different. So that comes with different challenges. And when we select partnerships for distributed teams, it is important to pick um, our choices for least friction and challenges so that we can focus on our business goals. So today's webinar, we will discuss um, these different cultural differences between the different cultures and um, how to navigate these cultures. Um, and uh, for the scope of today's webinar, we will focus on Norway and Sri Lanka as examples. So um, to kick things off, uh, I would like to first invite Doug to set some light on unique traits of the Norwegian business culture within Scandinavia and also to talk about the importance of having um, low friction in the uh, distributed teams. Doug, over to you. Mm, uh, thank you, uh, Kalana. Uh, my name is Doug, as Kalana said. I have almost 40 years of experience from the IT industry in Norway, and over the last 25 years, I would say, I've been working with companies in Asia and Eastern Europe, um, uh, on both the sourcing and uh, with my own employees. Uh, so what I would like to uh, to share with you is some of the, of the insight and, and experience I have uh, from from over these years. Um, and uh, when we say Norway and talk about Norway in relation to Scandinavia, it is important to understand that or, or to know that uh, Norwegians uh, or yeah, Norwegian and Swedish and, and Danish cultures are also different. Uh, so even though we very often talk about Scandinavia as a, um, as a region, um, and we also share a very common language, so we, we can easily understand each other. There are certainly differences uh, into that. So we'll concentrate on Norway uh, in this um, in this webinar. It is very important that foreigners who comes to Norway for work or work to work with Norwegians from abroad have an insight into the Norwegian working environment how we interact with others and some of the traps that we can fall into without a deeper understanding of each other's behavior, culture and form of communication. But also to effectively, effectively work in a multicultural environment as a Norwegian, we need to have a good understanding of our own culture and how we communicate. So the responsibility is not entirely on foreigners to cater for a successful rela relationship, but also uh, the Norwegians. Norwegian culture and the way we communicate is something we could talk about for hours. So I would give, only give a few very general examples of a rather complex area. We can start uh, with, uh, with the coffee culture. Uh, we are a people of few words, I would say. Um, 
we are not communi very communicative uh, and open. We um, have a tendency to even be a, a little bit shy. Um, but and, and we love to sit at our desk and concentrate without too much disturbance and, and small talk. However, we drink a lot of black coffee and we need to go to the coffee machine quite often to fill our mugs. And there we talk and interact with our, with our colleagues. We share secrets, we talk about our private lives, what we did last weekend, and of course, we complain about the weather, our main hobby. But more importantly, there are work-related things that are being discussed, and many problems are being solved around the coffee machine. So if you are in Norway, pay attention to what happens there and join in the dialogue to get closer to people and to making friends. Probably the best uh, place to make friends, um, at the office at least. I would claim that Norwegians are very easy uh, to work with and, and, and kind to work with. So if you, know, if you know how to handle them at least. We are generally nice to others and helpful if you ask for help. There's a fundamental trust deeply rooted in our culture, which relates to both the society, your friends, co-workers, and, and our employer. We also expect autonomy and independence. So what we, what, when I say that you would need to ask for help, there is another fundamental thing in the Norwegian society, society which we call frihet under ansvar which tra translates to what freed with freedom comes responsibility. And from a young age, we are told to do our best in our own way. And if you are unsure, feel free to ask. And I can tell I have seen many fathers throwing their kids into the ocean or the, uh, in a swimming pool. There are not so many swimming pools in Norway, though, uh, because of the cold weather. Uh, but throwing them into the ocean and ask them to, to, to swim. And this is a brutal way of uh, raising your kids, but it's a, it's a very good example of this frihet uh, under ansvar. So with, with this trust-based society and with freedom uh, comes responsibility, there's also a lot of tolerance to fail and to make mistakes. And unlike many other cultures, you will not be punished and looked down on as long as you try and you do your best. But please remember to be open about mistakes uh, and mistakes that you make and upfront with uh, if you are in doubt or, or, or in trouble. Another angle to this frihet and ansvar is what we uh, um, the, is that we have a rather fle uh, flexibility when it comes to working hours and the time at the office. Most Norwegian couples have full jobs uh, and very few have nannies and, and maids at home, meaning that you will have to deliver your kids to the kindergarten and pick them up before you go home and prepare your dinner yourself. And then the evening activities start, such as football and youth choir and chess classes and what have you. So what you will find, though, is that many Norwegians with this flexibility at work that we highly appreciate, we work from home for a few more hours after the kids are put to bed. So what I'm saying is that <clears throat> although it, it may look, we may look lazy, um, and you may think so because we we'll leave office at, uh, at four o'clock or, or even before. Um, we uh, essentially cherish this freedom um, and we also at the same time take, take full responsibility for our, our work and our job. So when it comes to communication, the single most important thing to remember, I would say, is not to say yes if you don't absolutely mean it. Never say yes because you think that is what your coworker or manager will hear from you and expect from you. Be brutally honest uh, and say exactly what you mean. Th that's what it, uh, it what say expected from you. Uh, and, and there you have some fundamental differences between uh, the Norwegian and maybe Scandinavian culture even and Eastern European and most certainly Asian cultures. Um, so um, 
I would say that is the, the most important thing. But another uh, important factor to remember uh, as a foreigner in communication with us is not to interpret too much what the Norwegian is saying to you <clears throat> when it comes to criticism or feedback. We uh, we speak direct to uh, to our colleagues and and coworkers and, and and in general, and if you are in doubt again, please ask. Instead of thinking that there is a hidden message or underlying issue that is not addressed or expressed specifically, normally what you will hear is a very honest and direct feedback related to something specific, without any other agenda or mixed message. Um, so these are just a few reflections on what I have experienced over the years working with foreigners in Norway as well as with co-workers in various parts of the world. So feel free to ask questions uh, later on in the webinar or comment on these reflections. So no back to um, Colin. Quick, yes, a quick uh, comment um, or, or a clarification here. Doug. You, you mentioned that um, um, Norwegians might leave early, let's say around four o'clock, uh, right? Uh, but how, can you also explain a little bit about um, how they treat uh, time when they're at work? Uh, are they, uh, because I know you have short lunch breaks, for example, yeah, right? Yeah. That, that's correct, uh, yeah. And uh, here um, in, in, in our uh, small office, uh, we have li like 10, 15 minutes only. We, we go to the cantina, we enjoy a good lunch, but we are not uh, spending too much time uh, there. And, and we work very effectively, I would say. So uh, even though we, we, it may seem that we come late to the office and leave early uh, in combination with this late hours type of work and very highly effective work hours, we get the job done normally. But Hello. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for helping us understand the Norwegian culture and also uh, probably the expectations that comes with it. So that's an interesting uh, start to our webinar. So next, um, I'd like to invite Hasit um, as uh, it would be interesting to take a closer look at uh, some of these specific examples from cultures and to understand how these um, cultural differences play out when uh, we put them together. So Hasit, um, with your experience in working with uh, Norway, uh, Sri Lanka and other geographies uh, for uh, over 20 years, um, how do you see uh, these cultural aspects uh, put together? Yeah, thanks uh, Kalana for the uh, question. I have a very uh, short presentation. Uh, before starting uh, the presentation, Doug, uh, when you mentioned the coffee machine, uh, that's actually uh, one of the life saviors when we uh, when we are in Norway. Because a lot of times, as you said, uh, just as Sri Lankan Norwegians, I found them little reserved, shy. Uh, Sri Lankans are the same. Uh, but when you uh, when you add the coffee machine, a lot of great discussions uh, uh, get started. Um, and we have a tea culture in Sri Lanka. We have a tea time, right? Uh, I think that is also sort of something which we can probably uh, compare uh, what mm. happens uh, during tea and what happens during um, during coffee. And um, where, uh, of course, as you said, the weather is a great topic uh, to small talk in uh, Norway. Um, uh, if you are ever in Sri Lanka, the topic for you to uh, talk in Sri Lanka is traffic, not weather. Yeah. <laughs> All right. With that, um, um, let's uh, take a look at uh, strong commercial relationships uh, between Sri Lanka and Norway. Um, do you know that there are hundreds of Norwegian businesses operating in Sri Lanka? In fact, last time we checked with the Norwegian embassy that was in 2019, the count was around um, 350 Norwegian businesses in Sri Lanka. Even the uh, great Norwegian uh, sovereign wealth fund has invested in around 20 Sri Lankan companies as far as I know. So the country is being 5,000 miles away in ge different geographies, different um, historical backgrounds. How is this happening? 
I believe we will uh, find the answer to that question during uh, next few minutes. I'll uh, try to put a bit of a framework um, on the culture um, out of what I had experienced and learned during the last 20 years. So when you see the drivers of different cultures, I hope you can see my screen uh, with uh, value driven behavior driven. Yeah, cool. Yes, that's it. Um, the drivers of different cultures, there are uh, two um, routes you get the differences. One of the routes is your values in the society. Another one is more like the the uh, behaviors you um, you had developed over time as a country. Um, in my observation, what makes Sri Lanka highly compatible with Norway is due to the similarities in the first segment, value-driven cultural aspects. So I'll be focusing a little bit more about these five. Uh, dimensions I had mentioned uh, under value driven during my uh, next few slides. Um, whereas um, Samara uh, in the following presentation will talk a little bit more about the uh, behavior driven aspects uh, where we see differences between the two countries and how to tackle and work around the same. So let's take a deep dive into these five aspects of reaching consensus communal responsibility, employee voice, gender role differentiation, and motivation to succeed. Motivation to succeed. Um, these are crucial factors, the value driven factors, because they resonate deeply with the values held in people's hearts. The first um, dimension reaching consensus. In my observation, one of the main aspects that make or break a team culture is how they look at getting into decisions or how do they do negotiations? How do they do conflict resolution? Are you looking for efficiency and speed in these aspects? Or are you looking for consensus of the team? And broadly, you can see these two common approaches in different cultures. And some cultures prioritize the speed and efficiency, whereas other cultures focus high value on reaching consensus. So if you see the cultural traits of Sri Lanka and Norway, you can see Sri Lanka and Norway both are onto the right side of the scale. I for the Comparison and clarity, I had put uh, US and India also into the map. In all of the scales, you will, see, you will see all these countries so that you can compare where each of the country uh, fits in the, in, in the scale. So, so what I had seen is in Norway, the decision making is very inclusive. You need to um, listen to everyone's voice. And the goal is to ensure that everybody is on board before moving forward. Very similarly in Sri Lanka also, team consensus are very important. Uh, especially uh, Sri Lanka is a culture where group harmony is highly valued. Um, however, the difference I had seen is in reaching, how, how we approach in reaching. In Norway, usually we see more uh, open debate uh, in reaching into consensus, whereas in Sri Lanka, you have the open debate plus one on one discussions um, uh, to ensure that everybody is understood, comfortable, uh, and on board with the decisions made. So, this, as I said, is one of the very important value driven cultural dimension. Right? What do we value? Do we value consensus or do we value speed and productivity? And the second um, dimension I'd like to uh, take a look at is how we look at the communal responsibility. Again, we see um, cultures which are uh, putting very high value on um, community orientation, whereas certain cultures which are more uh, self, more, more heavily uh, rely on self rela um, relapse. 
this is again an area we align uh, very much. Um, we all know, even though Norway is identified as an individualistic culture, so the, Norway is said to be personally individualistic um, and communally collectivist type of a culture. Um, Norway has a very strong sense of equality and shared responsibility. I think we see this with a lot of volunteer work um, and, uh, and also how we look at um, collective success. Um, Norway has this, um, uh, Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Yante Lovan, Law of Yante, where you say you are not to think that you are anything special. I treat everybody the same way, type of uh, value uh, thought from um, very young days. Similarly, in Sri thanks. Similarly, in Sri Lanka, we have this notion of respecting every being, every living being. Um, and also, Sri Lanka values deeply uh, the teamwork community. Think if you're Sri Lanka, think about how we come together for what we call Sharmadana, volunteer community work, right? Or how we all pitch in during what we call dansa, free food offerings. Um, and in the same way, in a workplace setting, um, we see that um, how we value communal responsibility plays a major role in team satisfaction and how we do the leadership and also how we recognize people within our team setups. So this is again one of the areas where we have a strong overlap between the countries. Meanwhile, uh, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to uh, raise them over the Q&A. The third aspect, um, another strong similarity uh, of Norway and Sri Lanka is how we value employee voice. In Norway, I think employee voice is um, rooted in, in Norway's uh, egalitarian mindset. Everyone's well-being matters um, and uh, well-being is actively encouraged. Uh, in Sri Lanka also the respect, even though the respect uh, for hierarchy still exists. Sri Lanka traditionally uh, being uh, somewhat hierarchical in nature, we still have the respect to hierarchy still existing in Sri Lanka more than Norway. But that doesn't mean that employee voice is any less important. Um, we have a very uh, strong employee rights, well-beings, um, supported by uh, robust uh, labor laws in the country. Um, and also, uh, if you look at work-life balance, uh, you might be surprised uh, Sri Lanka is in par with Norway where if you count the mercantile holidays and the vacation time. right? Uh, we are in par with Norway, even with uh, Norwegian summer vacations. One other indicator you can see uh, which highlights the importance of employee voice in Sri Lanka is its approach for something like lay, lay, um, layoffs. Unlike in, um, uh, sorry, I don't have the scale, so uh, here it goes now. Unlike in the US where we see the mass layoffs, which are very common, uh, such actions are almost unheard in Sri Lanka. It's usually considered taboo and uh, would seriously harm a company's reputation. And this cultural norm sort of reflects uh, both countries' deep respect for the employee stability and well-being. And, uh, and I think it, uh, it, it makes Norway uh, very much aligned with Sri Lanka in, in terms of uh, values when it comes to how we treat employees. And this is also one of the very interesting aspects to look at, gender role differentiation. We all know Norway is one of the countries uh, leading in the gender equality. 
where both men and um, women uh, equally contributing the society and also at the workplace. And you might, if, if you are from Norway, you, you might actually be su surprised that Sri Lanka also has a very, very strong progressive stance in this area, especially uh, compared to more, uh, all of the other Asian countries. In fact, Sri Lanka is said to be the most feminine country in Asia, just like I think Norway is the most feminine country, if not in the world, at least in uh, Europe. Um, Sri Lankan uh, women uh, had been part of the workforce and leadership roles for decades. If you don't know, Sri Lanka has produced the first female prime minister in the world. And uh, as I said, we are considered to be the lowest uh, masculine culture in Asia. So this shared value of gender equality helps to create a very balanced, fair, team uh, orientation when it comes to a cross-cultural team between Sri Lanka and Norway. And to the last value-driven attribute I'd uh, discuss is the motivation succeed. Some countries are highly competitive, we know that, and, uh, and uh, have the focus on material success over the focus on the quality of life and harmony. I think uh, it's no secret, both in Sri Lanka and Norway, um, the motivation to succeed for an individual is closely tied to the concept of quality of life. Um, for our culture, success is not just career achievements or financial gains, but how well we balance work with personal well-being, family time, time overall uh, life satisfaction, and quality of life, uh, essentially. So this focus typically leads to uh, workplaces that uh, prioritize work-life balance, health, employee happiness, and sustainable practices when it comes to uh, work patterns. But in contrast, um, countries like probably US, India are more biased towards the competitive achievements. Uh, their success is often defined by winning um, the competition. Um, and there are a lot of research papers and uh, common, uh, common research done around this area. Um, there's a white paper uh, done by 99X uh, on it with a lot of references uh, to uh, original sources also attached. So we will share that white paper uh, with you for you to dig deep and uh, verify uh, some of these uh, attributes. So overall, we compared Sri Lanka and Norway in five different value-driven aspects. To wrap up, even though Sri Lanka and Norway seems very different uh, at the first glance, one being a Western, extremely wealthy nation, the other being an Asian island with uh, deep-rooted traditions, we actually share a lot of common ground when it comes to values. Um, these shared values is in my opinion, is a secret ingredient that makes our business interactions smooth, as, smooth and successful. Like for example, for 99X, uh, we never felt any other country when we do business uh, more closer to our values than when we do with uh, when we do business with Norway. So the next time uh, when you are working with uh, Norwegian or Sri Lankan colleagues, I think uh, if you learn and remember some of these overlapping areas, uh, you can use them to build much stronger and effective teams. That concludes my part where I, I, uh, I compared the uh, value-driven dimensions of the two cultures. I think uh, we'll have one other following uh, presentations uh, to discuss 
further on some of the differences. Kalena, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Hasid. Um, it was very clear to see the different dimensions and how they differ from each other and uh, it on a scale. It uh, helps us uh, to understand uh, these differences clearly and uh, we'll only be able to tackle them uh, with that awareness and understanding. So um, that brings us to the next topic uh, where we try to uh, gain experiences from Samra uh, with her experience on how to tackle these differences uh, in our practical day-to-day -day collaborations. Um, so Samra, uh, please tell us uh, you know, with the experience, how we tackle them and some concrete examples that uh, we can go back and implement with our distributed teams uh, that come from uh, different uh, cultures out here. Thank you, Colin. A good question. Uh, right. So navigating cultural differences um, has actually been a very important part of uh, my role. So working in uh, with teams in both Sri Lanka and Norway over the past uh, close to 10 years, I've learned that um, understanding these differences is key to getting the best results in our projects. And um, each culture has its own strengths. And when we bring these together, they can actually really complement each other. So, um, so that's something like one of the biggest learnings I've had over my um, years of experience. And uh, before we dive deeper, I would uh, like to highlight some of the main areas where cultural differences often show up. So you saw a bit of this in Hasid's previous presentation as well. And uh, these are differences in communication styles, how each culture approaches tasks, for instance, the various attitudes towards uh, taking initiative and risks. And finally, how time is treated in each culture. So. Now that we've outlined some of the key differences uh, where you know cultural differences could show up, I'd like to start off with the most fundamental difference, that is the difference in communication styles. So one thing that we can all agree on is that uh, effective communication is key to any successful project. And um, when you have distributed teams and with different communication styles, so it can be a bit challenging. So if you look at uh, how Norway handles communication, for instance, it's direct and explicit. So people say what they mean uh, and that too with minimal details and they expect others to understand from clear, straightforward instructions. And in contrast, in Sri Lanka, the communication style is more indirect and context based. So people expect more details and might assume that further clarifications will come through uh, through ongoing discussions. So let's take, for example, a Norwegian product owner might provide very brief acceptance criteria for a new feature. And this leaves room for various interpretations. And on the other hand, the Sri Lankan team is used to more detailed and context rich communication. And this they might expect more guidance. And this difference can lead to misunderstandings and uh, confusion as well. And um, also people express emotions differently. So for instance, uh, Norwegians might give feedback very directly. And uh, I recall Doug also touched upon this, where you know, when you compare how Sri Lankans might take this feedback, maybe they might show feelings through facial expressions. And this can sometimes lead to some misunderstandings. So these are some of the like a few scenarios that may arise when you consider the cultural difference on communication styles and we can look at some strategies that have helped us build the sort of these great gaps on the communication differences and how it has also helped us improve teamwork in our diverse teams so first off is induction programs so when we bring in new employees on board we talk about the cultural differences and this happens both at a company point of view when we have the induction programs and also when any new joinee joins a project. Now, this helps them understand how we communicate and work better uh, and a better understanding of how this difference in cultures could kind of strengthen and complement one another. So they have all this information from the start. And in addition to that, we also have a feedback process where we regularly check in with new employees to see how they are adjusting to the new culture and also to help identify if they're facing any challenges. 
So this is one approach we've taken, uh, starting from the very beginning when we onboard new employees. And we also use a more hybrid communication approach. So we've used a mix of uh, clear direct messages, which is more familiar to the Norwegian culture. And we also add extra details when needed, and which is something that the Sri Lankan culture is more used to. And as Daga mentioned, like one thing we always uh, encourage, encourage our teams is not to work based on assumptions. So we always encourage them to ask questions. So right from the beginning, we ask questions, we clarify, we use tools like flowcharts, mind maps, we take down detailed notes to avoid any misunderstandings. And this helps us ensure that everyone pretty much understands what's expected. And this also makes our communication more inclusive because we've combined the two differences, which can kind of complement each other. And another thing that has really proved to help us uh, along the way is that we've involved our developers, QAs, and designers early on to help identify important workflows. So they work very closely with product owners to brainstorm ideas and to also write requirements, which is otherwise typically expected from a product owner. So here we have our teams involved from the very beginning, ensuring that everyone's input is included. So this has helped us a great deal because it leads to more clearer and more complete requirements. And uh, last but not least is the fact that we leverage project management tools to keep everything transparent. So this is how we organize our work and things like dashboards help us share information. And in most tools nowadays, you are able to automate some tasks. So this has helped us reduce manual effort and it also keeps everyone aligned. So another key area where cultural differences have come into play is the approach to tasks. So Norway, they prefer like flexible approach where they're able to quickly adapt to changes, while Sri Lanka, on the other hand, values a more structured approach to maintain clarity and consistency. Now, both these approaches, they have their strengths, and uh, we've implemented a few strategies to strike the right balance. So looking at the first uh, approach that we've tried out is that we operate in small teams. So each team handles a specific project or feature. And these teams organize themselves. They make uh, quick decisions and they adapt, able to adapt to changes more easily. And this way they can manage their work more flexibly while also being able to stay focused and also deliver efficiently. And uh, I know that we all appreciate a fixed roadmap uh, that doesn't change, but we also need to understand that the business landscape is constantly changing. So that's why we use dynamic roadmaps uh, where we update regularly, and uh, this is depending on new priorities that come from our customers. And this approach has helped us to keep everyone aligned, and it also allows us to reprioritize our work quickly when needed, and it also ensures we stay responsive to changes. And uh, like we touched on this uh, in the previous slide, uh, we use project management tools to handle everything directly in the project. And uh, another thing that we try to do is to take the best parts of different methodologies, so be it Scrum or Kanban, we combine the best you know, users of these methodologies to suit both our clients and our team's needs. Another area that uh, we've observed where this difference comes into play is the approach towards taking initiative and risk. So in Norway, uh, taking initiative and being proactive is highly valued, and they do it very frequently. So team members are encouraged to take risks, uh, to be independent, and to bring new ideas to the table. So they see this as a way for people to improve and grow. In Sri Lanka, the focus is more on careful planning and uh, we follow assigned tasks. So while taking initiative is also important, there's this strong emphasis on being you know, cautious and making sure everything is done correctly. So some approaches that we've taken uh, to uh, drive initiatives in our teams is to set the expectations very clear that team members are encouraged to question our current ways of doing things and they're able to suggest new ideas. So there's no such thing called a hierarchy. Anyone can challenge anyone in the team. 
So this also has helped everyone feel confident in speaking up and bringing in new fresh perspectives. And we also actively ask team members to come up with new ideas and improvements. So again, we've set goals for innovations and we regularly check in on progress of these innovations as well. So again, this is another way where we've kept everyone focused on being creative and finding better ways to work. And uh, this was uh, another thing we touched on in our previous discussions uh, with uh, Doug and Hasid. Um, so this is quite an interesting cultural difference in how time is viewed. So in Norway, the focus is on quality. They prefer shorter focused work hours where everyone is efficient and they get things done and they get things done quickly. So they believe that working smart and not necessarily working harder and long. So in Sri Lanka, people often see longer hours as a sign of dedication and hard work. And the idea of spending more time at work shows commitment and that could also lead to better results. Now, if you look at it, both views actually have strengths. And Norway, Norway's approach helps maintain a good work-life balance, and while Sri Lanka shows a strong work ethic. So we were able to find the right balance by combining efficient work with hard work by implementing flexible work hours. So this allows our team members to choose their most productive times to work. And this flexibility also lets people work efficiently while also being dedicated when it is most needed. And uh, we've also set clear goals to measure success by what gets done, not by how many hours are spent working. So this has also helped us to change that mindset and it helps us to stay productive without overthinking or overworking. So now we've explored various cultural differences between our teams in uh, Norway and in Sri Lanka. And as you can see, each difference offers unique strengths that we can use to our advantage. So to sum up, um, I mean, if you are in a situation where you're trying to understand how to bridge the cultural differences, start off by trying to understand and respect the different work styles and preferences in the different teams. And uh, that will help us understand the cultural differences first, and then try to use specific strategies to close these gaps. So this is guaranteed that it would also improve teamwork. And last but not least, combine the best parts from both cultures to achieve the best results. So as you can see, understanding cultural differences and using the right strategies can definitely help us work better together. And this is tried and tested, and this is what we observe in all our teams uh, working with uh, our customers in Scandinavia. And I hope I was able to share some insights on the, what has worked best for us. Yep, thank you. And over to you, Kalana. Thank you, Samra. Uh, thank you for sharing the practices that are proven to work, have worked for you and a uh, lot of teams out there. Uh, something that uh, everyone can adapt uh, straight away. Yes, um, so we have received some questions from our audience. Um, uh, as well as um, some comments as well. Um, uh, thank you for, uh, even though we are not able to enable audio for uh, our audience, uh, thank you for uh, sharing your comments um, and sentiments as well and the questions. So um, going into the questions, um, we will start with uh, the question from Indika. Um, so the question is, are all cross-cultural cross differences bad? Should we aim to find a partner with similar culture attributes? Uh, this is an open question. Uh, any of the panelists can uh, pick up. Yeah, I, I see um, Christian has also given a very good answer, um, saying uh, I, I think cultural attributes are not, there. there's nothing called good or bad cultural attributes. They are just different, right? Um, that, that's very important to understand. Uh, the challenge is if we don't understand that cultures are different, uh, if we don't learn about uh, the different cultures and we don't understand the different cultures and why they are different and how they are different, sometimes it feels like uh, there's something not working uh, it, in between uh, the teams or it being in between two people. Uh, but that is not the case. Uh, often it is actually uh, the cultural differences 
uh, had conditioned us in certain ways, we, we, we feel it's not a match. I have this uh, uh, famous uh, example I uh, talk uh, a lot of times. Uh, I had seen uh, sometimes in the past um, Sri Lanka team members come and uh, say, uh, hey, uh, my Norwegian counterpart was uh, saying my code is uh, not appropriate or this is not how you do the architecture here. Uh, right, uh, direct feedback. Sometimes uh, if you are not from a culture where uh, you appreciate uh, direct uh, feedback or you are not used to direct feedback, you are more used to uh, more contextual feedback, then it, it, it can appear uh, something like uh, that somebody is really attacking you, uh, sort of right. Uh, and then um, the, uh, the the Asian counterpart might actually be, be a little uh, feeling emotional, and you might even express a little bit of emotion um, at the uh, feedback meeting, uh, because in Sri Lanka, uh, emotional expression is more common compared to Norway, and Norway. In business settings, you usually do not do the emotional expressions, but in Sri Lanka, it's sort of accepted and uh, in a way uh, norm. In a way norm, and this can really uh, take the Norwegian counterpart in surprise. That okay, why is he so angry, or why is he having emotions? Right, uh, this is a direct feedback. And, but if you understand that cultures are different and they, we can actually, one thing is we un, then we know why it is happening and also we can actually adjust our behavior according to the uh, situation. So that is why cultural education is so important. But apart from the cultural education, as I said, um, uh, when you look at differences, these differences can be, um, can be complementary. I will give you another example. Uh, let's say in task handling, if uh, if a one culture uh, prefers unstructured uh, tasks and more agility, more changes, frequent changes, whereas another culture prefers a bit of a bit of a structural way of task handling, we know that in um, in in creating software products, for for an example, you need to have at least some time of stability uh, for you to work in a distributed team. Uh, so in that you bring the agility from a particular culture and also the stability uh, from another different culture and we complement each other and uh, and find a um, find a better better outcome at the end of the day and these cultural differences can actually be uh, used uh, for the greater result better outcome However, as I said, there are two types of cultural differences, value driven, uh, uh, rooted in value, rooted in behavior. Sometimes uh, rooted in behavior, things are easy to deal with than the cultural differences which are rooted in values. Thanks, Asit. Uh, yeah, and I really like the examples uh, that you brought up, especially one with the uh, mismatching or rather cultural difference that works in favor towards an outcome uh, of like uh, when you take the example of tasks. Uh, Doug and Samra, uh, would you like to add anything uh, to the same question? Uh, I think uh, Hasid covered this uh, very, uh, very well. All right. did yeah. yeah, so then uh, we can move on to the next question that we have on Q&A. So um, the next question is, can you measure the success of cultural integration in a distributed team? Are there any specific indicators? Uh, again, an open question. Yeah, maybe I could uh, start. Um, so I think that's a really good question uh, because you always need to measure in order to improve. Uh, one thing I see that has worked is that uh, we could use uh, simple things like retrospectives to measure the cultural integration because this kind of forum involves all our team members from different cultures. And if there are any gaps in the integration, usually it gets flagged during these sessions. And in addition to that, uh, what has also worked is uh, surveys that we send out to our teams. And uh, this also has helped us check cultural alignment and the understanding of these difference among team members. And uh, apart from that, the 
typical surveys like customer satisfaction surveys, team satisfaction surveys. So if there are any escalations in those surveys, what we could do is try to understand if the root cause is due to any cultural differences that's causing these issues. And this would also be uh, help us to measure the integration success. So uh, these are some of the you know, various tools that we've used to measure indirectly whether there's, there's been a successful integration in terms of culture. Uh, thanks, Amra. Uh, Doug, uh, do you think these measurements um, are same in your perspective, probably coming from a Norwegian culture? Yeah, well, you, you are. I mean, in terms of the the measure of success, and so you are closer to the engagements and the customer interaction. Uh, so normally, I will uh, get feedback on a much more, let's say, higher level and more general type of feedback. And and uh, so in in general, what I hear is that, let's say, the 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 the, the, the success factor is rooted in the quality of the products. So what we are able to bring to the market together is the ultimate, um, let's say, proof that uh, the, the, the cooperation ship is working and that we are bridging these cultural gaps and communication gaps and differences that we have. But we so we work towards the same common goal and, and, and thrive um, yeah, as as a team, uh, to uh, to really make a successful product um, together. So um, I'm not sure that that is a very specific thing, but this is typically what I experience when I I speak to uh, to product owners and business owners um, that we um, engage with. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, so I think uh, we can move on to the next question that we have on Q&A. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, um, directed at Doug. So uh, the question is, uh, uh, world is polarized or getting polarized due to conflicts, political viewpoints and uh, technology advancements and etc. cetera, uh, as economic rifts as well. So um, how this affect different ethnic groups living in Norway and how do the Norwegian uh, Norwegians respond to these changes? Wow, this is a big uh, question. Um, it is absolutely true that we uh, we, we live in a more uh, polarized world and and um, the, the, of course uh, all this um, affects us in a way how it affects different ethnic groups um, um, is harder to say. I would say it's in general, my, my f opinion is that we have a very open society, respect for individuals, freedom of uh, speech is deeply rooted in our society. Um, so uh, from that perspective, I, I think ethnic groups will feel at least have the uh, possibility to uh, to to act like Norwegians. Um, but of course, some uh, immigrants that we have uh, in Norway uh, from you no know, latest from from Ukraine, like uh, fifty thousand or so, more, even more. Um, they come from from a, a country at war. Um, so so it's it's, and they are still uh, uh, living with conflicts and and have families back home. How how this affects them in their daily life is extremely difficult to uh, to um, uh, say. Uh, but I, I hope they feel safe and welcome and that they are integrated well. Um, but integration is something that we uh, have a, a, an open discussion about. It is, uh, um, is uh, there's uh, an election uh, this fall for a new parliament. And, and this is one of the, the big topics that we, uh, we, we see in, in, the, in the debates. 
So we, we still have a long way to go when it comes to uh, a good integration of, of immigrants. Um, how Norwegian respond to, to these uh, changes is also very different, but we we, we try to to cope with with all the threats and polarization that takes uh, takes place in the in the world. Technology advancements, for instance, is um, uh, something that we we embrace uh, and try to take advantage of, and also uh, try to use as uh, as a platform for for new innovation. So, but again, th this is something that we could um, uh, have a, uh, a seminar, in, a web seminar in its own, and, a, and maybe a, in a, even a conference. So um, I'm not sure. Th this is probably very general, but but still, my 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 feedback. Thanks, Doug. Uh, yeah, it's a complex topic, but I think you did justice uh, within a short period of time. Um, there is a follow-up question which I have missed with regard to the previous discussion of um, the uh, measurement of cultural integration. Um, yeah, this uh, question is from Christian. Um, so the question is more about um, uh, when it comes to um, like uh, onboarding, uh, especially with the new customer, like um, uh, at Nitronic, we do have a program to um, get everyone updated about the Norwegian culture. But how about other way around? Uh, like um, what measures that uh, Nitronics would have to create, uh, you know, uh, the cultural awareness, uh, vice versa? Probably Samra or Hasit would be able to answer this, I guess. Yes, um, I, I think cultural awareness is a is a topic um, we had been uh, working on throughout, um, as far as I can remember, for even last uh, ten fifteen years. Um, so there are uh, multiple uh, uh, trainings uh, conducted, uh, multiple uh, awareness sessions, and training material created, and even we have a training. Uh, on Norwegian culture, on our training uh, e-learning platforms. Um, but at least, uh, I think Christian's question is about uh, are we doing well enough to make the uh, Norwegians aware of the uh, Sri Lankan culture? I would say uh, we are a little suboptimal on that, uh, Christian. Probably that is something we should, uh, yeah, I think we should catch up. We need to have some material uh, for Norwegians to understand the Sri Lankan culture also. The white paper uh, we had developed is uh, is what we share right now. Maybe we can actually uh, have more uh, extended uh, video or something like that uh, for someone to learn further. I think there are good suggestions and uh, one way, you know, we've tried to uh, create that awareness about the Sri Lankan culture is related to a comment on the q &A about meeting and getting to know each other outside work. So with our customers, we always take that time to have like casual chats. We go out, we have fun, and that's been another way where we've learned to understand the difference in cultures. And uh, it has really been very, you know, educational, some of these uh, meetings. So, uh, but then that's a definitely a good suggestion to uh, have more awareness on the Sri Lankan culture. Thank you for those answers. Um, we are almost at the end of the time that we have allocated for um, this uh, webinar today. So thank you for uh, all your questions and comments uh, that you have uh, added in the, uh, the Q&A section. And uh, Doug, Samra, Hasit, uh, thank you for sharing your learnings uh, for today's uh, discussion. Um, so we uh, looked at uh, these different cultures, how to gauge them, uh, how to create awareness, and also some concrete learnings that we can pick up uh, and implement when we work with the uh, distributed teams. So uh, like uh, Hasit uh, mentioned, um, uh, if you'd like to read more about um, these um, cultural uh, 
uh, attributes, dimensions, and um, uh, a bit more uh, data uh, around how to tackle this. Um, uh, do a further white paper uh, that is shared as a link uh, on this chat. Um, thank you for joining for the webinar today. Uh, we look forward to have you joining uh, our future webinars as well. Have a nice day, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>